I'm Roderick Bowman. I I am Dutch and I work in the Netherlands um, as a bulb taxonomist at the KAVB, the in English the Royal General Association for Bulb Growers. Um, and I will get to the other na names in a few minutes. Um, and uh, alongside us working as a bulb taxonomist, I also worked on my PhD in systematic botany at the Botanical Garden here in Leiden in the Netherlands, which is where I met Zorin. <laughs> um, so during this presentation, I will just start with a simple introduction in, into the Netherlands and why we are quite well known for especially bulbs in the ornamental plant sector. Um, and some terminology that might be good for the rest of the presentation. And then I will go into a brief interview into the history of bulbs in the Netherlands of when they arrived till the current industry that's behind the whole sector and what is produced. Um, so that will continue on to the modern times. And then that will continue to my work at the KFB, which is in cultivar registration. Um, and first, I wanted to, to show, well, what is the first thing that people think about when they hear the Netherlands, if they can even pinpoint it on a map, then the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, mm. windmills and usually cheese. Um, mm. Also the wooden shoes, which I didn't put in here, but I know exactly two people, I think, that have ever worn the wooden shoes. So mm. that's the old stereotype. <laughs> um, but I wanted to show a short video. This is from the 1950s. And I think the sound is terrible. A lovelier picture than any artist would hope to paint is made by the miles and miles of flowering tulip bulbs between Harlem and Leiden in Holland. These are the world famous bulb fields laid out like a colorful giant carpet behind the sand dunes close to the North Sea coast. 3,000 million bulbs, enough to make two colorful girdles round the earth and grown here every year. The flower heads are picked off so that nourishment is not taken from the bulbs in the sandy earth below, but it takes seven years to bring a bulb to full maturity. The millions of heads and petals are thrown away, the world's sweetest refuse, or used for local flower festivals and parades. So the, the yellow one is daffodil, right? Uh, yes, the, the yellow one is the daffodil. Um, so yeah, this is just for the impression of, um, well, 50 years ago, but there's a, it's a nice introduction into part of the bulb sector. So you could also see some of them were still wearing the wooden shoes, but yeah, I know very few people who own any of the pairs. Um, and as you could see that, yeah, this was about a uh, little overview of how the fields looked and the hand picking of the flowers and that flowers were either thrown away or made into these giant bouquets. You can still get these, the the little flower uh, yeah, shawls, actually. Um, those are still sold in the time period, but the flower picking itself is all mechanized, unless it's very, very small scale. Um, so the other part that the Net Netherlands is known for nowadays is as a, a land of horticulture. Um, we are, the, our country is quite small, but we are quite big in 
using all of the space efficiently. So, for example, on the image on the left, you can see just that the land is, is parched up into, into segments which are all used either for crop rotations um, and growing of, yeah, from ornamentals to food stu stuffs and all of it. And also on the other side is that we have a lot of greenhouses for the, for the ones that are not accustomed to the Dutch climate. Um, so before I continue with the rest of the presentation, some things to just know for general background. Um, so I work at the KAVB. Um, in Dutch, it's the Koninklijke Algemene Vereniging voor Bloembollencultuur, the Royal General Bulb Growers Association. Um, we, in my department, I work with the registration of new cultivars, which are cultivated varieties that have been, have been produced through selective breeding. So that means that there is an actual act of um, selecting the variation that you want from starting with natural variation, of course, crossing it, making hybrids perhaps, and then selecting over generations, which one, which characters you want to keep and then producing in that way, special varieties that are distinguishable from each other. Um, so for that, we have the short term of cultivar, which I will use quite a lot. Um, the KVB is an ICRA, an international cultivar registration authority. Um, I will elaborate on that also further in the presentation. Um, and sometimes I will mention the term of PBR, the, which is plant breeders rights, which is a form of intellectual ownership um, and property rights. So this is more of the the judicial side of plant of yeah of the bulb sector um, and yeah DUS research is one of the the staples of my work which is where we these are like the three main qualifications that we require require from a new variety before it can be registered uh, in our database and also, I thought um, since you were all from the, but on biology or botanical background, it would be good. I need to know that um, although we folk, we call ourselves the main bulb growers Associ association, of course, it's not all the the specific bulbs that are that we treat. We also work on the ones that fall out of it. Um, so the typical bulbs are the tulips, the alliums. Uh, in one corner, but we also have some uh, plants that have a below ground enlarged section, like the large tubers of the dahlia, um, very specific subgroup of the begonias, and we work on other plants that have corns like the crocus. Um, right now it is the, the season where all the bulbs have been taken out of the ground and in a month or so it will be put back in just before the winter comes. Um, so now is the season to, yeah, to buy and plan ahead. Mm. So um, these are some examples of the plants that uh, I work through throughout the year. Um, not all of them are shown because the number of plant genera is quite big. Um, but of course, none of these are actually native to the Netherlands. <laughs> So some you might have already guessed where they come from. Uh, the most well known is of course the tulip, um, which I will focus on on art during this presentation, um, which is from mostly Central Asia. And of course, this is probably already long known by most of you um, that some some of the parts that we plants that we get actually grow here. They come either the dahlia is more from Mexico. Um, the daffodils are actually more from a Mediterranean climate, even though they are you know, widely cultivated here in the Netherlands, but also a lot in the UK and also in some in the Southern Hemisphere in New Zealand. Um, I also work on Hippiestrum, which is, which is not the true Amaryllis, but it has it is known under the name of Amaryllis. And that one is from South America and also on uh, Zantadesio uh, from South Africa. And a lot of bulbs, plant, bulbiferous plants actually come from
from South Africa. So um, for that, I'm very glad that I had to do field work there once, even though the time between the field work and starting at the KVB as was five years or so, but it helped for my, my own background in this. So the origin of the Dutch tulip. Well, we, we all know now that the tulip is not Dutch. It's just that we, it is particularly well suited to the Dutch. Um, it arrived here in the 16th century, um, like it did in most of Europe. And it is thought that it actually originated from the ones that were grown in Turkey, which is in itself already a, maybe not an original form. There are some species there, but just on the border of their main distribution. And some with the more pointy, the pointy tepals were actually the most popular in Turkey itself. Um, and then it was introduced here in the 16th century. One of the main yeah, stories that we tell is actually from uh, concerning the first director of the botanical garden here of the city in Leiden, where I live, um, which was Carolus Clusius. Um, he was a famous botanist in Europe at the time. He worked at several courts there, and he was asked to become the director here in the botanical garden that originated in 1594. So the botanical garden here is over 400 years old. And at the time, he, when he came here, he brought his own plant collection with him, but he also had a lot of contacts through Europe. And he just wrote a lot of letters, just asking them, please send me additional material of plants that he liked. Um, he was mostly interested in those with medicinal value um, because the original goal of the botanical garden was to uh, assist in the teaching of medical students that they get familiar with the plants that are poisonous or the ones that have any medical effects that they could use. Um, the first tulip, we have now some that you can, that have been naturalized here in that they can, that they form populations here, but they originally arrived through somewhere in this, during, around the Mediterranean or from Turkey. Um, and the original one that we ascribe most of our tulips to is Tulipa jesneriana, um, which is supposed to be also the one that was introduced first. And this, but there is some thought that it might also be Tulipa sylvestris. Tulipa jesneriana is not a real species, if you want to call it that. Um, it, it, nobody really knows what it exactly was. It was described, mm -hmm. but it is thought to be already a hybrid of something that was selected over time. It was a red flower species or red flowered variety. Um, and from and all the tulips that we currently grow, we also we about eighty percent or more is ascribed to being originated from that. Tulipa jesneriana population, but then there has been selections gone from the Netherlands, also selections in Belgium that got mixed over time. And now some of the bulb grower companies are also moving towards incorporating some other species that they've uh, introduced. Um, some of them are like Tulipa fosteriana, um, and they want to introduce and crossbreed these back with the varieties that are grown in the, in the Netherlands, um, because those usually have an improved um, yeah, defense against uh, against other plants or against herbivores, and they want to get that back because it's currently a, a big struggle of having a giant monoculture and not using too many pesticides. And also, the, um, the amount of pesticides that we are allowed to use is variable. Um, some of the older ones are disappearing and the introduction of new pesticides is a constant yeah kind of a race against the clock it's just one gets banned and another one gets introduced and it's a constant cycle of that um, so there are ways that we are trying to cope with this and also change the market um Clusius was not only that he introduced tulip but he also introduced some of the other 
uh, ball wafers plants here. Um, sorry. Um, other well knowns are, for example, the lilies, but, and also fritillaria, which you can see in the photo, um, which was taken from this year. After, after the, yeah, this was really at the end of the 16th century, the 1590s, and then in the 17th century is when, um, yeah, the bulbs began to spread actually to more private growers. Um, Clusius itself was very protective of his, and there was a small section in the garden where all the bulbs were contained, and also, as legend has it, got an extra fence built around it to keep away any that would want to steal them. And then in the 17th century, they started to grow it mostly in the area between Leiden, where I am now, and Haarlem, because the sandy soil here was found to be actually quite good for tulip growing. Um, it started in small private gardens and small plots of land, and it was at the time more of a status symbol. It was an exotic plant, so if you manage to, aff to afford one, then you must be very rich person mm. and one of the mo most well-known periods of time in the Netherlands is known from the 17th century the bulb mania period where mm. um, the prices of bulbs actually skyrocketed over the course of a few years um, and some of the most sought-after colors were so popular that people bought people paid enormous prices for that um, one of the most well known is Semper Augustus, um, which, for, as some might know, is a, a very specific tulip. You cannot get it anymore. Um, mm. And this was kind of a, to give an indication of the price range at the time, because, yeah, and this was still in the time of the Gil Gilden. Um, now we have the euro in the currency. Mm. But. Yeah, the highest price at the, that was in the 17th century was in the year 1637. We know these from buyer's notes at the time from the auction house. Um, so the highest price that a tulip bowl, a single bowl, was sold for was over 5,000 guilders. Mm. And this is where the story came from that for that price of one bowl, you could buy a house. And that was not an exaggeration. And the funny thing about the Semper Augustus tulip is it is the most well known, but it is also a tulip that is sick because the, the broken color pattern that was coveted so much is caused by a viral infection. Mm. So nowadays the, the tulips that we grow, we, they are yeah, closely monitored if there are, if that specific virus actually top. Uh, pops up. It is the the TBV, the tulip breaking virus, um, because it breaks the color into this scattered pattern. And there's only a few companies, maybe one or two, that on purpose grow these infected tulips just for the effect. But otherwise, it would also inhibit the the health of the bulbs itself. So, yeah. So most try to just pick out any plants that show this infection in the fields and try to get rid of it as soon as possible. But it is kind of ironic that the most expensive tulips ever sold were probably the ones that were actually very sick. So yeah, that was from the, the 17th century, so the 1600s onwards. Um, I'm skipping a little bit ahead because otherwise if I have to summarize the whole history, I think I would need a bit more time. So I'm skipping now to the, the 19th, uh, 20th century, which is where actually the real upscaling of the production began, the industrialization era. So uh, for, after the the bust, actually it was a, also like an economical bubble bust of, after the tulip mania, because it was at the climax in 1637, but at that time when the season came up and all of the tulips were actually sold when they were just being put in the ground. So at the end of the season, when they were taken out of the ground and then the growers came to 
came to the buyers with you promised to buy it for so much money um can we finish our deal the buyers didn't have the money to actually pay them and that's when the market collapsed mm. it took some time but the market rebounded but the tulip price has never reached that maximum and with the industrialization in the 1800s the tulip became actually more accessible to other people to more people in the in the public um, and it was for a time actually also um, passed by that people were growing more hyacinths instead of tulips and it only made kind of a recovery in the last in the 20th century also when some of the some of the varieties were introduced for for example from belgium which were a very strong varieties that were quite big um, in comparison with the dutch ones and they had very big flowers and these specific ones have been crossbreeded now also in the current assortment of yeah mostly tulips some of the more famous stories is for example, the book from Alexander Dumas about the black tulip, mm. which is, yeah, it's a, it's a novel, but it's about the greed associated with that one goal that a lot of companies still have of creating the black tulip. Mm. There's not really a black tulip, just very, very dark purple ones. Um, but each few years, people try again to ever get closer to that goal. Uh, some of the other notable times in history actually were during the hunger winter, um, which was a period during the Second World War, where food stocks here were running out in the 1940s, and people had to resort to other kinds of food. And one of them was actually that they sacrificed, to, for example, tulip bulbs in the cooking. Mm. Some other plants were also used, but not all of them are actually, um, yeah. How, ready to eat. So how, how, do, how do they eat a tulip bulb? Sorry? How, how did they eat it? How did they, how did they cook? Um, so, what, so they stripped the outer tunic, like in the black and white picture of it, and then they usually boiled it. Um, and there is actually a, I think it was a recipe book that came out last year with some of the, yeah, the grandma's tales of what, how they cooked and prepared tulip bulbs. Um, this was a time that a lot of people actually um, starved to death. So it was, um, yeah, it was just at the end to just after the Second World War. Um, so a lot of war recoveries um, still had to be done. So people were desperate. It's not the most healthy or tasty. Um, the modern variant is that, yeah, there are some cookbooks that have been produced now using bulbs. Um, that book came out, I think, maybe one or two years ago. And for that, for those, you can actually make it yourself. Um, but you do need biological, biologically grown bulbs because the other ones have pesticides on them. It's not mm. that healthy for your diet. Um, but I will go, get to those later. Um, Nowadays, if you want to see some of the more older varieties, there's actually a place in the Netherlands, um, a bit more in the north, um, which is relative because for me, it's probably a two hour drive. Um, and then I'm almost at the end of my country again, but it's called the Hortus Bilborum. And it is a specific yeah, place where they actually retain tulip varieties through history. And the oldest one they have is over 300 years old that they still vegetatively um, produce. So there you can see all kinds of old varieties of tulip if you want to visit. So it's different than the Keukenhof, but might also be quite nice to visit if you ever mm -hmm. have a chance to visit. Um, maybe I, I think I will skip this one for now actually um, and go back and continue on and maybe we can see it at the end this is a short clip basically summarizing about the history of the tulips um, so we can do that maybe later um, and i want to skip to the bulb growing in the 21st century so during modern time 
Um, I've used some graphs from a report from the University of Wageningen, um, which is available at this link. Um, it is in Dutch, so I will translate some of the graphs. Um, in the current industry, it's mostly a matter of specialization. Um, a lot of the big companies have actually focused on either yeah, developing new varieties or taking the new varieties that have been registered and gone through the process, and but they still need to be made into a big enough stock so people have a stock to keep behind, but also part of it that they can sell on each year. Um, because the tulip fields that, and all the other bulbs, of course, that we are known for, um, all those fields that people see and come to visit are actually for the production of that year. They are put in the ground there to grow and that they make side bulbs, um, which they can then, the following year, they can sell the main bulb, which is big enough for the market to be grown as a cut flower or as a bulb on, in pots. And then the side ones, they can put back in the ground to grow for the year after. So that's actually what the giant fields are there for, not for the main. Um, it is appealing for the tourist industry, but the main goal is actually the production of more bulbs to sell later on. Um, so that's a very specific branch. Um, and yeah, part of those that they produce are sold to companies that focus, for example, on the forcing of flowers. Um, that is with temperature manipulation that I will come get to in a minute. And others are, of course, focused on um, facilitating, negotiating the trade and export of all this plant material that is produced here. So the current system here is one of modernizing and upscaling. And yeah, I put the tagline from family business to big business because um, the tulip sector, it's you see very few new arrivals that start a new company. And a lot of them are started, for example, by the younger generations of existing families that branch off or they take over from their parents or gra grandparents even. Uh, it's usually a very generational shift that is still present in the sector. And from this, actually, in green, you can see that in the, re in the last, yeah, this is from till two 2017, we see a decrease in the in the number of companies that are in the Netherlands. But actually in blue, which is the total area and of the Netherlands that is being used to produce bulbs, it kind of fluctuates around the midpoint and has even increased slightly in the last few years. And this is because the smaller businesses are usually then bought out or someone retires and sells off their land to one of the surrounding areas. So the average surface per company, which is the orange line, is actually increasing mm. because the existing companies themselves are, gro are just becoming bigger. And this is kind of a, a characteristic of the market of what we see here, um, is that yeah, some of the smaller family businesses either sell or younger generation doesn't want to take over mm -hmm. um, and they sell it to one of the big businesses or also bulb growers associations that they that's some of the companies that work together to produce together and some also manage to become big enough that they can cover all of the specializations on the market from the developing of new varieties to growing stock to forcing the flowers and selling those in in the market so just numbers for background um, this is the amount of acres that is used to grow each um, category of bulbs um, so the biggest ones in orange are the tulips um, followed by on top of the green is actually the lilies and from there it's the, the specialties um, which we call the, the miscellaneous bulbs um, this covers also, for example, crocus and fritillaria, but they're usually all very small sections that we just categorize together. Usually they are also the, the spring flowering plants. Mm -hmm. And then we have daffodils, hyacinths, and some gladioles. 
Um, these are all, of course, it's a seasonal market, so not all of this is included. This is just the, mostly the spring plants. Um, to make it a bit more easy to understand, if you take the total amount of area covered in the Netherlands by all, all of the bulk plants, then you can see here that almost half of it, more than half, is tulips, and then all the other parts cover a smaller section of the market. So where are all these bulbs grown in the Netherlands? Well, not our whole country is covered with it, um, even though we are quite small. We still have specialized areas because not all of the soil is um, the best for growing it. Um, the biggest area, which it is currently actually, it used to be at the Red Arrow, which is where my company is located, mm -hmm. um, in the area between Leiden and Haarlem. And the most well known is Lisse, um, which is also where the Keukenhof is. But a lot of it has moved to the northern part of the country, um, which is where you can see the green and the blue colors, um, which is also actually a shift because in the area around Lisse, it's mostly sandy soils, and up, it's more clay. Mm -hmm. And this co does come with a difference because the original bulbs is that they are usually from dry areas with um, yeah, varying temperatures, usually by night and day, um, and also from more mountainous regions. And the Netherlands, well, our country is very flat. Mm. That's what we are known for. There's maybe one or two that we would call mountains and someone else would call a hill. Um, that's all relative. And I can hear you snickering. Um, yeah, but the clay soil, it's more heavy. It also retains more moisture, so it needs a different production. But it, the nutrients that the bulbs capture actually creates bigger bulbs that are easier to sell. Um, but in terms of the machines that you need to use, it needs to be more resistant to extra forces. Um, and it's, yeah, for example, heavier to get them out of the ground. So there are specialized techniques to cope with this. Uh, then we get to the the, the forcing of flowers, which is one of the things that we are most well known for because people know they're usually accustomed that if they arrive in the Netherlands that there's always something to buy um, if they time it right. But um, flower forcing is one of the oldest practices here that has been around for more than a hundred years is where we give the bulbs actually a temperature treatment to induce flowering periods. Um, when we when we do it the, the normal way of growing them on the fields, um, the bulbs actually need a specific freezing period during the winter to actually be induced to activate um, so that they will yeah germinate in in the early spring and grow to a flower. Usually the flowering season the, the main point is between April and May, um, but using these methods of planting the bulbs either on uh, in soil, in crates or in pots, or one of the more recent ones is doing it actually in um, just crates in water, and then inducing a cold period followed by warm periods, we actually tell the give the bulbs an early signal of you can start flowering early. And there are shifts within these specialized companies over a matter of, yeah, maybe a week or two week periods as in this week, we'll start this sec this part of our stock. Then the, in two weeks or next week, we'll start this section. And by that, we will have each week, actually from usually January till June, we will have flowers ready that are that we can always sell. Mm -hmm. um, there's a difference a bit in the, the size of the plants at the start and end of the season. Usually the end of the season plants are a bit bigger with larger flowers. So I recommend those more. Um, but it is a way for us to produce more flowers for a longer period of the year and actually also sell those to other countries. Um, the January till June period is mostly tulips, but for example, some of the more summer growing plants um, like lilies and others, we can actually grow them over longer periods throughout the year. This is in the Netherlands, 
of course, which is in the northern hemisphere, but some companies have grown big enough that they are actually grow part of their stock on the southern hemisphere, usually in South America. Um, some have also moved, I think, to Asia, mm-hmm. but it's not as big yet. Um, the market is shifting towards other parts of the of the world, and yeah, by growing in the, both the northern and the southern hemisphere, some are able to just produce flowers year round. So we are an exporting country. Um, usually, the bulbs that I can get here in the supermarket are actually not that special. Um, the ones that we can with the very particular shapes are sold abroad or for shows. And yeah, on the bottom graph, you can actually see how much we import versus export. And the import is barely visible on the graph. And one of the largest countries that we export to is actually Germany, um, our neighboring country. Other parts are the EU and the rest of the world. And with the rest of the world, a large part of it of it is the US. Um, But we are starting to move also more towards Asian markets, um, depending on how easy we can export to those. Because there's always a lot of rules and regulations also about how healthy or clean the bulbs can need to be before they are allowed to be exported. Um, So here in a different format, you can see some of the, the biggest countries that import actually from the Netherlands. Um, in terms of cut flowers, um, bulbs themselves, and there's also in dark green, there is a section of um, plants from also the, the arboreal section of the of the sector. Um, this is in millions of euros in terms of value for export from 2019. So it is a giant market here in the Netherlands. And something that I thought was quite nice, um, just as a short because this is all mostly from the traditional growing that we do here in the Netherlands, um, which is still using a lot of pesticides. And there's maybe a a very limited amount of companies, maybe just even the one that specializes in growing biological flower bulbs. Um, And they have adjusted their whole routine to actually work on using no pesticides and treating their soil as healthily as possible. Um, Whether this will work for the giant upscaling is of course a question and it's also, of course, it's kind of a conservative sector. So these changes will be slowly, but hopefully progressively implemented over time. Um, And it is also with the changing amount of pesticides that are available, um, it is maybe one of the future demands of the industry. Um, So I wanted to show a short clip that I found on this company's website, um, which is for their, one of their machines from the that they use to actually plow the land and thereby, um, yeah, try to preserve the original mulch that they have. Mm -hmm. So this is a machine that this company developed themselves. And it's, yeah, it turns over part of the land with all the greenery and all, all the other plants that were normally not present due to pesticides. And it, yeah, it makes it, it <laughs> grounds it apart into creating a mulch that is still, yeah, that acts as a natural fertilizer, actually. Mm-hmm. So it says in Dutch below the the mulch mixture, the bulbs have been planted. And then this machine actually changes the ground or yeah, grinds it all up so that it's not that they're not outgrown by all the all the grass and other plants that have just come in through the surrounding areas. Mm. So that's kind of what uh, one of the companies that I found also one of the most interesting parts of the sector um, is that they have basically gone all the other way 
And yeah, the bulbs that they produce without pesticides are the ones that you can use in cooking. Um, mm. So it's a very specialistic market that might hopefully grow more. This is just a summarized vision of what the market here is in the Netherlands. Uh, the numbers you see are actually in the number of bulbs produced in yeah in billions. So um, the first step in the dark blue area is the veredeling, that is the, the developing of new varieties. From that goes the growing of stock, which produces 5.3 billion bulbs. And from this is all within the Netherlands. The one at the bottom with the 0.4 is the ones that are grown abroad mostly in mm. France, but also in some other areas. And from there, it all goes into the preparing of yeah, specific goals of these flowers and yeah, keeping them usually in giant cool control, temperature controlled cool cells. Um, and from there, they go to the large sale, which is either um, the top light blue is the flower forcing in the Netherlands, which is 2.4 billion, which are auctioned off and going to the retail stores. Um, part of it is the bulbs that are just sold in what we call the, the dry sale. That's just selling the bulbs themselves for people to plant, or mm -hmm. put them in pots, which is the current season, the flower forcing and selling of flop, forced flowers that are cut is from yeah end of December till June, depending on the plants, um, of course, the, gladioles and stuff comes after that and we are currently at the end of the dahlia season um, and in orange is all the yeah the dry sale of bulbs that you can buy um, and then plant later on mm -hmm. um, this is one of the the little side tracks i thought is nice to see um, i've tried to put in a few videos just to break the monotony of mm -hmm. my talking uh, which is each year we have of course the well i hate the music cho choice um but this is the the flower parades that are organized in different parts of the netherlands each year with the parade cars and um, usually there is a theme and each year something new and yeah there are special there's mm -hmm. specific working groups that um, work on creating these parade cars which are all done from yeah the flowers that are have been picked and they have been pinned usually with a, a metal pin to uh, one of these designs it's one of the nice things that if you come here in april or may to visit the area around lisse is then the Blumen Corso, as it is, as is, as it is known. Um, there's all other ones that are specific per season. There's a lot in summer, for example, with the dahlias, um, which are also very nice. And th this is in the area around Lisse, which is the Bloembolstreek, the, the bulb area as its uh, pet name. But the ones for dahlias are, for example, also partially in other provinces of the Netherlands. And it's always a big happening each year. Um, of course, it has been different now with the Corona times. This video, I think, is from 2018. Um, no, 2017. Um, and it uh, has not been for the past year, uh, in 2020. And this year, we only had a very small scale event um, where each area made one car that followed the routes uh, one day, but with very little public. Mm. Mm. So then we get to from, yeah, that's a kind of an overview of parts of the sector that we have now, which is, yeah, the, the tourist section, the real production of the bulbs itself and how these are uh, mostly exported to other parts of the world. Um, but there is, of course, a system that underlies all these varieties. Um, because if 
two independent companies create their own, yeah. usually either a red tulip or a new daffodil or crocus, um, they would want to know if it is actually distinguishable from what is currently on the market, if they have a new creation, and they want a name that is suitable for that variety. Usually these are fancy names that I will get to later. Um, but this is not only with bulbs, but it's with every ornamental plant, um, but also also every agricultural and um, just all varieties that are created, is that there, it, um, there was the demand for a system to keep track of all these varieties that have, are created worldwide. And to bring about this, but also look at parts of technological advance, advancement, coursework and all the, and trying to consolidate all that information of the ornamental and agricultural parts of the world, it, it culminated into, into the creation of the International Society for Horticultural Science, um, which is global and it started in uh, 1864 with the first conferences on it and it was an official organization in 1959. And what they have implemented is a system of ICRAS, um, which is at the start of the presentation in the terminology I mentioned, it is the International Cultivar Registration Authority system, where specific organiza organizations are appointed to um, work on their specific plant groups and register the varieties that are brought into this world. Um, it can be from hobbyists to the large industries. But um, the system was put up so that it's not that all the organizations have their own little da database that it's consolidated worldwide um, and that it follows a similar system. Especially with my department, we focus also a lot on the, on the nomenclature of all these varieties. Um, and uh, I will expl explain a bit more about that later on. Um, I think I have to hurry a bit more for my time, so I will skip through some of the slides a bit more. Um, if you go to the ISH website and you have created a new variety that you want to register, there is a list of ta for each taxa and which organization is the registration authority. Um, this is just starting at A and I picked out Tulip and then you see it diverts you to the Royal General Bulb Growers Association, which is where I work. Um, this is some of the, the history of the cultivar names that it changed actually um, how we do it over time. Of course, we are now mostly used to the binomial system from Linnaeus, which was stuck for plants. Um, the starting point is 1753 with the species Plantarum. But before that, of course, there were records of varieties that were um, already around or people found something in the wild that was not the same as the the other population that they found a white flowering for plants within a, a mixture and then they decided to keep that so usually they named it either after local people areas or just the, the characters of that plant well this is were still a bit short and during the middle ages it became a pattern of expanding these names because the binomial system hadn't been implemented yet so you got these very large sentences, the, like the, the Tulipa, Girardi, Jacobi, Lutia, Kamruby, Flummy, um, which is probably horribly pronounced, but it means the tulip from Girardus Jacobus, which is yellow with a red flame, which is as descriptive as you can be. Well, nowadays we use the system of the, yeah, the fancy names. So it's not allowed to be Latin, but it can just be any language, um, as long as we can write it down or transcribe it. Um, mostly English, but of course, other languages are also um, possible. I've got some uh, applicants that came in from China or from uh, Japan or India, um, which are sometimes more difficult for me to write down, but it's still possible. All the rules about the, yeah, how to create these fancy names 
is now culminated into the international code of nomenclature for cultivated plants. It's not the same as the uh, international code for botanical nomenclature, the international rules, but there are because there are some distinct differences. For example, in yeah the hier the non hierarchy that is present because you can just put all these varieties directly under the genus because usually the species themselves have been mixed and hybridized over time so much that they are barely recognizable and not attributable to one specific species and you can download the latest version or on this same website you can buy a hard copy um, but it is available for anyone um, of course the there are some uh, about using the same fancy name between different plant groups. Um, you can use, um, usually it's between different genera, 90% of the case you can use the same name. If I call it Tulip, I can call it Emily, then it doesn't block me from calling it Daffodil. Also, Emily as a, as a cultivated variety name. And Emily is just a standard first name of a person. Um, and some of these names can be can either be very simplistic in that someone uses a, a random city somewhere in the world to very elaborate names that have a hidden meaning. Um, there are some exceptions which we are we have summarized in the nature of denomination classes. Um, if there is basically no way you can mix up any of these plants, some of the example. Uh, I show here is in the in the brassica varieties of broccoli to cauliflower because it's well these are very separate um, units on the market which are you cannot mix them up that easily so the same name is usually allowed between these two plants um, one of the rules of course in the concerns the reuse of name if a tulip named Emily was already in existence once, then it's not possible or under very strict rules to reuse the name for another tulip. So that is within the same genes. Um, yeah, some examples of the rules, it's that um, they are usually, the fancy names are capitalized. Um, of course, there is a, there are some exceptions um, if that is falls within the specific uh, yeah, linguistic customs of a specific language. Um, the one example they give here is from the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, all the names should be published also. So we publish a yearly um, report actually with all the cultivars that have been registered that year. It usually comes out in January or February and they are available online. Um, but there are rules, for example, about yeah, misleading characters. That is the recommendation 21H. Um, for example, if I have a, a red tulip, I'm not allowed to call it pink sun or something like that um, because it's not pink. That's what we call with misleading as a simple example. So that's um, some of the main Registration authorities for bulbs, of course, um, is my organization, the KUVB. We also have the, the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society in England, which had, which registers the daffodils, the dahlias, and the lilies that we work with. Um, we also have the gladioles, which is in North America, and the nerines, from the nerine and amaryllid society. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see which of the bulbiferous plants that we register, this is all on the on the ISHS website, the the International Society for Horticultural Science website, on the taxa list, you can click on our organization and you will get this list. Mm. Mm -hmm. So this is from all the plants. Um, some of them, I don't. We do not get applicants for every group each year. Um, some I have gotten once every few years. Some yearly, of course. Um, so some examples that I pointed out with the red arrows, Colchicum, um, which is uh, also called um, 
yeah, in Dutch, Herfst, Tylos. It's a European bulb plant um, from the Colchicinaceae. Um, and they, these are, they are nice, but they're not a big part of the market here. We have one at the garden now, uh, Galantis, which is the snowbells, and yeah, of course, tulips and a lot of other things. Um, Allium, part of it, but we only do the ones that are categorized under the ball barrier, which doesn't treat most of the edible ones, luckily. Um, so this is how our organization is structured. Um, we were founded in 1860 as an advocate for the bulb sector um, towards yeah, the government and other parts of the world that we try to discuss also about rules and regulations in the law. Um, we also have a part that's focused on education um, and uh, which is where mine, mine falls, which is under the public department of nomenclature, but there's also a part that focuses on law um, and some of the yeah, conflicts that can arise between companies. Mm. I work at the department of nomenclature, um, which was one of its original tasks, um, trying to consolidate all the information, tulips and others, um, into one spot. and also with all the varieties and um, where the statue on the right is from Krelage, who was one of the original founders of our organization um, we're still in the hallway um, but today i'm home so i cannot walk over there um, so we work on the registration which is part nomenclature um, and part of looking at the plants if they are distinguishable from varieties on the market and making descriptions that are usable by other companies for quality control, um, also for the government with the export lists that they can check with the description. Um, is this plant the one that this company wants to export abroad? Mm -hmm. um, which we make very elaborate uh, descriptions using the RHS color chart, um, which is usually very busy in April and May, when most of the plants are flowering. Right now it's with the, the end of the dahlia, so I have a bit more time. Um, we also work on virus checks, and if there are specific questions about identity, um, people can submit um, those for our testing garden that we work with a committee of specialists to check um, for, is it the plant that is mentioned? Is, it, um, is the whole stock mixed with other varieties? Um, and we give a recommendation based on that. Um, so yeah, uh, a part, big part of mine throughout the year is we are now working towards planting again. And then in this is supposed to be spring. It has been a very weird spring this year. Um, so this is already in March or February, where we still had some snow showers. Um, so we had actual evaluations with our experts in the snow for daffodils and hyacinths that were already flowering at the time, which was weird and cold, but uh, yeah, it was cool. And what we do have for tulips is that we keep a reference collection because each year we get over a hundred applicants for new varieties of tulips. So it is good to keep track of what is there and we don't have everything by a long shot, but we have over 2,000 tulip varieties in our garden. For each variety, we plant about 10 bulbs, um, which are here then organized by the different groups that they are placed in. Um, so we always have some referenced for comparisons and others that we think might be useful. We always ask the companies to send those um, to compare. So this is some of the comparisons, some of the more difficult ones from this year. Um, on the left, we have, these are all plants that are actually not newly produced seedlings, but they are uh, sports of existing varieties, which is also a, a very separate but difficult market. Um, so on the left, we have three color variants that originated from one variety, um, which in the field, if you look at it, you have a, a white patch, a pink patch, and one just in between. So these were approved. 
but some of the others were more difficult like the mm. the orange one with a little purple shade we this is from one that was already registered and the one on the left that is uh that was sent in as new but we did not think it was distinguishable from the existing variety um, and in the bottom is another one that was sent but that one will go for a second year because one of them has a has a solid flame the one on the right and the one on the left is not entirely solid but the current recommendation is um, that it's probably not distinguishable enough mm. but this is a, a difficult procedure each year and there's a lot of stakes also that go with it with creating a new variety and getting a monopoly because the monopoly is the intellectual property which is organized through plant breeders rights um, which is also a separate one this is also really written down in the law of the, of the netherlands um, in some countries it's known as the plant patent um, which companies can apply for that they monopolize a specific variety so no one is allowed to grow it without their permission and permission is usually organized through specific contracts where other companies pay a fee and through that they can get part part of their investment of developing this new variety back because mm -hmm. for example with a new tulip creating a new variety to bringing it on the market can take over a period of almost 20 years so that's quite a big investment for the future. Mm -hmm. So they want to get that money back in some way. And that can be through the intellectual property rights. Um, I'm skipping a bit ahead because I'm seeing for my time. Um, do you mind sir, if I run out a little bit? Um, you can, you can. Okay, it will not be that long. <laughs> yeah. um, so I looked up some of the yeah, there will be a new version of the guidelines um, because also the plant breeders rights have a separate rule book also on the names which is 90 percent in agreement with the the book of the icras um, some variants that i need to keep track of otherwise a, a variety can come in the, onto the market under two names which we don't mm -hmm. want um, an update to these guidelines will be produced next year um, of which i am in have been in several meetings um, internationally in the past few weeks. Um, I looked it up and Thailand is not registered with the, the UPOV convention, um, but they have been in contact actually. But there is a different way where plant varieties are protected in Thailand, which is under Protection Act um, 1999, of which someone else might pro is probably more knowledgeable than me for the specific demands and circumstances of that. Um, there has been some contact with the UPOF, but I don't know how far along they are in um, either agreeing to join or not. Um, of course, there are. Um, each country has to agree and follow specific step, steps to join the UPOF convention. And now I just turn to some of the more colorful slides of the presentation, which is some examples of the various plants um, that I work with throughout the year. Um, so, so this is with um, from left to right. The white flower is the ornithogalum. In the bottom is the iris, then gladioles. Um, then we have in the bottom right the lilies. The orange flower is cocosmia, and in the top uh, is the muscari. The, the blue grape plants and yeah this process of creating new varieties as i've mentioned it takes several years of breeding plants or finding variants in an existing stock um, and growing those to that you have that you find in a in a batch of purple plants you find one white flowered individual and that one you vegetatively produce to get more bulbs uh, until you have enough to maybe present it as a new variety or that you found an, a new sport of a variety. Um, this can take several years and in some plants it is accelerated by the use of tissue culture. Um, one of the examples is in lilies, but for tulips this technique has not yet been 
fully developed, or at least not to the extent that it is, um, yeah, that, that, that you actually get back enough of the investment. It has not been successful mm -hmm. enough, and it's one of the main goals of the industry here is to create it from tissue culture just to accelerate the production aspect. Um, yeah, then come years of testing, is it suitable for the market? Um, is it virus resistant or not? And then after selecting, registering the var varieties with us or through the, plant, through the plant breeder rights and then marketing them. You, maybe the, the last few steps of the marketing and the registering, they want to hurry those up as soon as possible. Um, they could slow those down for my part, but uh, it happens. So yeah, just a, a short overview. If you have a new variety, usually you come to us with a name proposal, which is checked um, according to the rules. Is it If it's not in use already or blocked by something else like trademarks, then it either gets registered or goes for the plant breeders rights and we can uh, register also the ones that have the property rights in our database. Uh, this is a, a schematic of the whole process, which I photographed in a specific company um, for hippiastrum growth, which is about from uh, the top row from yeah, uh, pollinating existing varieties, breeding, crossbreeding them, then getting the first harvest, which are all green, and then after a few, a uh, few years, you have in the third year for hippiastrum, they start to flower for the first time. So the first few years, you have no idea basically what you have, uh, what the result is of the pollination. Then it starts to grow the stock and selecting, more selecting, and then registering it and in the end selling it. Well, some of the examples of the major groups within tulips, which are the the simple ones to the ones with the very mm -hmm. spiky long tepals, um, which are called the lily flowered group, even though they don't really look like lilies. Um, other ones you have that might, might produce several flowers on one stem. Um, of course, the double flowered ones, which can get quite big. And some of the other shapes with weird margins or very crumpled flowers that are almost rubber like or spectacular color patterns um, or very heavy cut tepals. Um, because this has been an ongoing uh, process of the selecting and the breeding over centuries, a lot of weird shapes have come onto the market. Um, even, but still also the most typical red tulips are also still produced that are just a little bit bigger or different, more rounded flowers. and. Yeah, as I mentioned, we get more than 100 applicants each year for tulips alone. Well, some major groups for daffodils, which are also a lot of double flowered ones, uh, a lot of simple ones, um, the small bell flowered, and also some that actually have an, yeah, kind of a cut open or exploded corona, which is like the canasta type, which are flattened against the flower. Um, which give a very different effect. Usually these are organized in different cultivar groups um, that have been established and those are maintained by the, the registration authority for that plant group. My current work is with the dahlias. Um, for the past few weeks I've been visiting the dahlia garden for evaluating with my team of experts um, and registering new varieties of all shapes and sizes. Um, Davias are officially registered with the RHS, so I am in close contact with them, but they cannot, they, they do, do not visit every country that produces new varieties, so they accept electronic uh, applicants. And so we fill out the form and make the descriptions so that they can be added to the RHS register. Um, yeah, some of the work that we also do in this part of the season is the quality control, um, mostly virus checking before the bulbs go back into the ground. Um, and also parts that we do is whether there is abnormal growth within the bulbs. So on the pictures on the 
On the right uh, in the top, you have one that shows a lot of small side spurts with no main ball. And in the bottom is one main ball with a few side spurts, which is more the desired effect. Because otherwise, at some point, you only get the small ones, which might not flower each year. So you don't have enough to sell to the market. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in conclusion for this presentation, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, future aspects of the market is hopefully that they are developing tissue culture and tulips to speed up the process. Um, I'm involved in a project with DNA, incorporating DNA identification uh, in the registering and then of for specific varieties and perhaps a larger section for the biological growing. And as some of the tips, if you ever visit the Netherlands, is do not buy any bulbs in spring because those are usually the, the runt of the litter that has not been in the soil <laughs> and those are usually just dried out and will never work. Uh, there's no such thing as a blue tulip, except in glass. And the flower fields are some of our national heritage. Um, and some of the farmers are very protective. So try to get permission if you ever want to enter the flower fields for any photos or what. Um, thank you for having me to give this presentation.